Today we're getting into some of my favorite topics, serendipity and the microbiome. We have two super interesting science researchers, one looking at how fecal matter transplants can improve the efficacy and responses to cancer treatments, and another one looking at the problem of antimicrobial resistance. So combinations and serendipity are what matters on today's episode of Discovery Matters. My name is Saman Maliki, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology and Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Western University and a scientist at Lawson Health Research Institute. And I'm an immunologist by training, and my area of research is in translation on immuno-oncology and microbiome as well. Immuno-oncology and the microbiome are distinct distinct things, not often mentioned in the same sentence. So how did Saman come to focus on both of those things together? Yeah, until recently, often separate fields. Saman did an undergrad and master's in microbiology with a focus on immunology. He did then get a good background and an understanding about microorganisms. But funnily enough, he couldn't wait to get away from those little critters. I didn't like them that much. I, I was very much interested in immunology of cancer as I was going through the grad school. So I, I did my PhD in, in tumor immunology and cancer biology. But what happened was during my postdoctoral training, which was here at Western, I was working on a completely separate project, and that was about finding uh, biomarkers for immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors. That project started, but the thinking around microbiome started in 2016 for me when I was looking at the very early evidence in the literature about what can, can be used as a biomarker. There were some really, really interesting but early observations in patients who received ipilimumab, which is the anti-CTLA-4 drug. And there were some mouse studies that they hinted at a potential role for microbiome or some signatures in, in the gut that could predict response or associations to response. I got fascinated by that. And we, we published that paper in 2017. It was a review article. And I remember that I had to fight the reviewers for about six months because I, I put microbiome as one of the biomarkers and they would not buy it. They wanted me to take it out. Saman really had to fight for the recognition that the microbiome was having an effect. And we see that often, don't we, with the microbiome. We've talked about it before on this podcast. And as the children's book says, everybody poops, but still people are resistant to talk about it. They are resistant to its impact on our health. And it just makes you wonder why. Like, do we really need to persist with this feeling of, ooh, it's the microbiome? There are a few things. One is that microbiome is still a pretty big black box. We are still just touching the surface, scratching the surface with all these studies that are coming out, just understanding the microbiome. And there was a parallel, even in immunology, if you go maybe 20 years back, when the novel immunotherapy was making a comeback in oncology, and I say comeback because immunotherapy is an old science rather than a new science. A lot of people don't understand or know that. But it was ignored for the longest time, and I think partly it was because the immune system itself was a big mystery, and still is in many ways. So I think the science didn't really caught up with the immune system back then, and still not there completely with, with microbiome. Part of it comes from the long association of alternative therapies with like making yogurt and kimchi and pickled food and sauerkraut and fermentation. But you know what they call alternative medicine that works? Do tell. Oh, they call it medicine. Ah. 
Anyway, gut colonization by bacteria in most probiotic foods is actually really difficult to maintain. You've got to be eating that yogurt or kimchi or whatever it might be every day to maintain a healthy colony of those bacteria in your gut. And there's some real resistance and reluctance because of the science here is lacking. Um, and some people just feel that we're not seeing enough proof that it's meaningful. So then let's talk about the study itself. What is the long-term hypothesis? So my general hypothesis was that it was actually quite simple. It was with cancer, which is a chronic condition, you will have dysbiosis. You have microbiome that is rather diseased in a patient who has cancer. And what I was thinking was that with doing something like a fecal transplant where you're getting somebody's healthy biome and putting it in somebody else's body at least we can get rid of some of the negative bugs so with a lot of microbiome modulation therapies people are thinking about okay we'll give you these immunogenic bugs and that is certainly important like people are thinking about acromensia bifidobacterium but my thinking to begin with was that it's more important maybe to get rid of your bad bugs and replace them with something that's more normal, healthy looking, because that potentially removes a barrier for your immune system rather than focusing on something that's really immunogenic to jumpstart the immune system. So it goes back to the similar thinking that we saw when checkpoint inhibitors first came about. The thinking was that if we can remove the brakes and step on the gas of the immune system, the immune system itself can fight cancer. So it is important to get rid of the nasty bugs that are hard to replace in patients, but it is also important to give what's known as immunogenic bacteria to potentially help the immune system. Exactly. So man's long-term goal is that not only can he restore the microbiome for a particular patient, but maybe even replace it with something that might be more beneficial to their particular uh, cancer treatment. So it needs to be personalized to the patient, to the cancer type and the stage of cancer that you're working with. So what might work in melanoma may not work in lung cancer or might not work in renal cancer or might not work in earlier stage melanoma patient. Uh, ultimately, we need to have some personalized microbiome therapies that we need to develop, something that can be tailored for a patient. The challenge here comes from where we are with the technology when a patient goes to the cancer center. Can they get a stool sample? Can they get a blood sample? Can they run the metabolites analysis and say, OK, you've got these deficiencies in your microbiome or you have these metabolites that don't seem to be useful for you and we can give you some replacement therapy? You know, it makes me wonder where where that association is at is aligned? Is the association of the microbiome and the particular genotype of cancer aligned with the patient, him or herself? Or is the microbiome aligned to the therapeutic drug and its mechanism of action? Or do all three have to stand on that healthy tripod of, you know, of, of working together all three? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. I think a little bit of all of it. I have a slide that I started a lot of my talks with. It has the patient in the center and has the, the tumor on one side, has the microbiome on the other side and the immune system, and they're all linked. And we know based on the evidence from a lot of preclinical and clinical studies that they all interact and talk and they can shape each other. We know through editing, the immune system can actually shape the tumor. The tumor can shape the immune system back and they can also affect the microbiome and the microbiome can affect both the, the immune response and the tumor. In a lot of ways, the microbiome in the cancer patient is gonna serve the tumor. So for example, in the study, we saw that patients who had lower alpha diversity, they actually had better engraftment of the host microbiome in their gut and they were able to, to retain it better. So that means they were more diseased. But Saman said something also super interesting about patients with a higher 
body mass index. Patients with higher BMI had better engraftment. So a higher BMI is not necessarily something that you associate with better response in oncology to treatment. In melanoma, there is an interesting phenomenon where patients with higher BMI have shown to have better response to immunotherapy in general. And that's partly because there was one study in Nature showed underlying inflammation can actually drive some of the response with immunotherapy. So that tells me, and based on some of the recent reviews that came out, they looked at different cancers and you could see different signatures that are associated with different cancers. So it turns out obese patients can respond better to checkpoint therapy and immunotherapy. And the hypothesis is that being obese means that your immune system is already kind of primed, triggered and ready working hard. It's absolutely fascinating. But that also tells you that the type of cancer or characteristics of cancer can also determine how these patients can respond to some of these therapies. And that is the difficulty with thinking that maybe one type of treatment would work for everybody. Perhaps FMT, not exactly a silver bullet, but it's something that is close to a more comprehensive therapy because one of the challenges that I think with a lot of developing the new microbiome products is that a lot of bugs that you might have in somebody's full biome, you can't culture. That is certainly a challenge for companies that are developing different cultures. And they tell me like uh, companies are try- trying to develop full consortia. But we have to remember that full consortia, it might be a bit of an overstatement where you can't even culture some of these bugs. The challenge here is that the bugs are anaerobic and they're really hard to culture because they're really fastidious. If you take them out of the environment that they love, like your stomach and inside, they die. So trying to isolate them first and then getting them into the patient is even more difficult. Sounds like a great challenge for science. So what are the next steps for Saman? What is he pursuing to push this towards clinical practice alongside immunotherapies? The hardest part for me was to sell this idea to the oncologists because at the time, nobody was interested in treating their cancer patients with with poop. So in terms of next steps for us, uh, we already have several other clinical trials ongoing. I do have a clinical trial where we're giving patients FMT from the healthy donors before they receive and during they're getting epinevo or pembroaxi and these are renal cancer patients. We've treated 17 patients on that trial already. It's called the PERFORM trial. The goal of that trial is to see if we would have a reduced toxicity signal in these patients because combination immunotherapy has a lot of toxicities, including colitis, in those patients. And we are trying to see with a microbiome therapy if we can prevent some of those toxicities. And we are working to open a trial in pancreatic cancer where we would give pancreatic cancer patients a fecal transplant before they receive chemotherapy because there is evidence in the literature that pancreatic cancer has a microbiome effect in it. There is a tumor microbiome potential with pancreatic cancer and there is obviously the immunosuppression. And a lot of these patients, they have a gamma protobacter in their tumors. And then we are working on a phase two trial where we are treating both melanoma and lung with, with fecal transplant and immunotherapy. Sounds like a lot of work, but also perhaps a lot of fun. And Saman sounds like he's really motivated by making an impact for patients. Yeah, so that's something that we can think of and come up in the laboratory and we actually can see it in patients, working patients. And every time I get a call from one of my oncology colleagues telling me the patient has a complete response, it's fascinating to me. It's incredible. You can't compare that feeling to any of the other feelings that you'll get in science in in many ways for me. So that is the main motivation, you know, to see something in my lifetime that can help patients.
So that was Saman and immuno-oncology and the microbiome. But look, there's more. You know, we've talked a lot about chasing one objective and failing, but later understanding that the experiments provided like a successful insight in an unexpectedly different way because, you know, the interconnectedness of all things in ways that we don't expect or understand. Completely. The classic kitchen table conversation example is Viagra, which was originally developed to treat angina. Exactly. And I spoke to Pete Didon at MIT. He and a team based in Singapore are looking at non-tuberculous microbacterial lung infections, which are really prevalent in the tropics. Most of these non-tuberculous microbacterial infections are pulmonary. They're lung infections. And they're very, very bad in people with any kind of chronic lung disease. Cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, a chronic lung disease from smoking, things like that. Very lethal and very drug resistant. So uh, I have this group in Singapore and in Singapore, these non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections in the lungs are very, very prominent. They're even more prominent than tuberculosis in the tropics now. So it's a growing problem. Cases are going up 50% every year in a lot of countries. The claim is there's an exponential growth of these infections. Pete and the team found that one antibiotic, rifaximin, when administered alongside another antibiotic, clarithromycin, can improve the way that the latter works against a particular bacterial infection. So these two antibiotics work together, which is really cool. But what's even cooler is how they got there. It was a serendipitous finding of screening through hundreds and hundreds of approved drugs, not just antibiotics, but we had a library of several thousand, I think up to 3,000 compounds that had been FDA approved already. And we were looking for compounds that increased the activity of a well-known antibiotic called clarithromycin. And what we were looking for was a compound or drug that would reverse the resistance against clarithromycin. So we set out to simply screen through thousands of compounds in combination with clarithromycin and find one that increased the potency of this clarithromycin against the resistant bugs. And bingo, rifaximin popped out. And this combination now is under development. We're getting ready to start animal studies, human studies, uh, with these two FDA-approved drugs in a combination Ah, serendipity. Amazing. So between Pete and Saman, we've looked at a range of problems and potential solutions by, in a way, breaking silos. That's exactly right. And we're going to hear a lot more from Pete in another episode because he had a lot to say about multidisciplinary and international collaboration in science, making advances where perhaps we couldn't otherwise. So more from Pete soon. Now let's talk about what we learned. And Connor, if you don't mind, I'll go first, because this particular episode has been about a couple of your favorites, the microbiome and serendipity. And another one of your favorites, the audience knows this, is fungus. Oh, goodness. Have we got a fun fun fact for the fun guy? We've got a fun Gus story. That's right. And this is from sciencenews.org, one of my favorite places to go just learn something quick and learn something maybe a little bit of amusing, but always mind boggling. So there's a new book out called Blight, which warns that perhaps the next pandemic would start with a fungus. Kind of like um, The Last of Us. Kind of like The Last of Us. That's exactly without the zombies. Ah, but zombies are fun. And anyway, carry no, on. No, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, and using the fate of the American chestnut as one example of how a devastating fungi can start and just never stop. I mean, a chestnut cannot grow in America now without getting this fungus exactly and right, ultimately yeah. dying. So maybe that will be the source of the next pandemic and the book is blight and it's going on the christmas list to send to you connor oh that's very good but you might have to talk to rachel who will tell you that you're not supposed to tell people what they're getting for christmas oh 
Anyhow, <laughs> but thank you very much in advance. Yeah. Um, and, well, never and, mind then. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming to you. It's not coming. You're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, it'll be coal in your stocking. That's fine, too. A lump of coal. Um, what have you learned? So, w- interestingly enough, that we were talking about microbiome. Um, th- so, there's a really interesting study that's been published in Nature Microbiology, which links the beginnings of anorexia nervosa with your gut microbiota. So it Whoa. appears that the what they call the pathogenesis of anorexia uh, may have some of its origins actually in dysbiosis, dysfunction in your gut bacteria. And the way that they've proved this was very interesting. They did a, a lot of analysis on people with anorexia nervosa and they did multiple omics studies on their microbiomes and their gut microbiota, and then they took fecal matter transplants from those patients, and they gave them, not to other people, but to mice, and they created anorexic mice. Well, I think that sounds like really interesting progress. In combination, a la the theme of this episode, in combination with treating the mental health of the people who are afflicted with anorexia nervosa. You hear it right there in the name of the condition, anorexia nervosa. So probably that combination of understanding the microbiome and understanding the state of mind and treating both perhaps will really lead to a change for patients of that condition. That sounds really interesting. Absolutely. And there's elements of the study which indicate that metabolites of the microbiome also, uh, in anorexia nervosa patients, also affect their mental well-being. So all of this is like extraordinarily linked in ways that we can't possibly understand. Yeah. And interwoven. Superb. Love it. Love it. Our producer is Beth Armit Brewster, editing, mixing, supervision by Banda Productions, music from Epidemic Sound. My name is Dodie Axelson. And I'm Connor McKechnie. Please rate us on Spotify or whichever platform you use. It helps us for mysterious reasons. We'll see you when we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters. Bye for now. Bye for now.